Good afternoon, everybody. This is 3 p.m. in London, 4 p.m. in Paris. Uh, some ungodly hour, 7 a.m. in uh, Los Angeles, where Roman is. Uh, we are very happy that he is going to speak at uh, our CPNR uh, Political Economy webinar today. Roman is a professor at the Anderson School of Management at UCLA. And today he will talk about barriers to global capital allocation. Uh, this is a paper co-authored with Bruna Pellegrina from Maryland and Enrique Spallore from Tufts. So the rules of the game, as you know, is in total we have 75 minutes. Roman will present during 60 minutes. Uh, in these 60 minutes, I will be monitoring the chat. So we, please uh, ask your questions on chat. Occasionally, I will stop Roman and ask him to uh, respond to your questions. Uh, he will not have his co-authors, Bruno and Enrica, on this uh, uh, call. So he will have to answer all the questions himself eventually. And after 60 minutes, we'll unmute people to ask questions by voice. So uh, please uh, welcome Roman. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sergey. Thank you, uh, Helios and Sergey, for this kind invitation. Uh, it's great to be here and with, uh, with, with this group. Uh, very, very happy to be presenting this work. Uh, as Sergey mentioned, this is joint work with uh, Bruno Pellegrino, who was my PhD student at uh, UCLA and now is at the University of Maryland, and Enrico Spolaori, who's been my co-author for uh, 27 years now. So uh, lots of papers uh, written together. And Enrico and I, uh, uh, you know, more than a decade ago, we started a project on trying to measure uh, how barriers between societies, uh, mostly cultural barriers, impact uh, interactions between them. And we've written a series of papers looking at um, uh, the transmission of technologies across borders, looking at incentives for different countries at different cultural distances to engage in armed conflict with each other, We've looked at the diffusion of new norms like fertility norms across societies and how they relate uh, to cultural distance. And for a very long time, we, we, have, we have been wanting to write a paper on financial flows and how they were impeded by barriers to, um, uh, barriers to interactions basically between societies. And um, uh, that's been in the background of our research agenda for a long time. And finally, about a year and a half ago, it kind of took off uh, largely with the addition of our young and very dynamic co-author, Bruno, uh, to the project, and it's led to, to this paper. So it's a bit of an unusual paper uh, for Enrico and I because it's much more uh, finance-oriented than our usual papers. It's also a little more macro-oriented than our usual papers. But the basic idea uh, uh, of trying to quantify barriers to interactions between societies, in this case, financial interactions, uh, is very much in the spirit of what we've been doing uh, for a number of years now, and uh, you know should ultimately culminate in a book at some time, at some point when we're done with all of the um, basically constituent chapters. So the basic question we ask in the paper is: suppose that um, you could take capital and put it um, reallocated across the world. Uh, how much of a gain could you possibly achieve uh, in terms of world income? Okay, so we're not going to really look at welfare. We're going to look at steady state income levels. And the answer is about 6%. Okay, so if you took capital uh, and you moved it around uh, from places in which uh, it is uh, invested now predominantly, largely because these barriers hinder its flow across the world, and you instead allocated it without regard for these barriers, you would achieve a 6% a 6 increase in world GDP. But more important than that, there would be some pretty dramatic um, uh, distributive effect across countries. And in particular, you would achieve much higher levels of GDP and GDP per capita in poor countries. Uh, so that's very significant. And one of the things that you would achieve with this, uh, with this reallocation would be a big reduction in world inequality. So let me just uh, motivate it uh, a, a little more. You know, if you look at the allocation of capital across the world, it's, it's pretty hard to reconcile uh, with frictionless uh, capital markets. Uh, and people have noticed this, there, there is a debate in international finance as to whether uh, capital is allocated efficiently or not. And we're, uh, we're very much of the view that it is not. So on, on the one, you know, the most obvious uh, point on this is, is the home bias that we observe. Most countries tend to invest in their own economies. And there's been a very long tradition of documenting this. 
uh, uh, one of the things that shows the, the home bias is that uh, international investment follows this gravity structure, much like trade. Um, we also see very large persistent differences in capital per employee uh, across countries that are not consistent with, uh, with allocation uh, being, uh, uh, being, being uh, frictionless. And then finally, we see very large and persistent differences in rates of return to capital. This one uh, is the most controversial uh, of the three uh, statements. Uh, there have been some papers in particular by Francesco Caselli and, and uh, uh, Jim Fryer uh, arguing that in fact, uh, rates of return, uh, real rates of return do not differ so much across countries. And we, you know, in this paper, we basically, uh, you know, uh, take uh, pretty much the opposite view to that. Although, uh, we, you know, we uh, uh, take great care uh, in implementing methods to calculate rates of return that, uh, you know, that incorporate everything that Francesco uh, and Jim have done. Um, the consequence of, of these observations are that you see um, uh, flows from rich to poor countries that are in some sense too small. And this is something that Bob Lucas observed in 1990 and it's become known as the Lucas puzzle. And we, we try to address some of that and try to understand why, why that would be the case. And our model does a pretty good job at matching the actual flows from rich to poor countries and as a result, you know, uh, uh, addressing uh, some of the uh, puzzle in the Lucas puzzle. Okay, so most of the literature, uh, you know, uh, doesn't really look uh, at uh, things in a world general equilibrium. So in trade, we have a workhorse model now, the Eton and Corton model that looks at, uh, you know, it allows us to do a lot of work across, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, across multiple countries, multiple sectors. There's no real workhorse model like this uh, in international finance. Um, in this paper, we try to explain uh, the facts by taking this more structured approach. So we're going to start with a model of international capital allocation uh, that generates the network of bilateral investment uh, endogenously and the rates of return. We're going to see that in order to have misallocation, you need to have uh, rates of return differentials. And in fact, the extent of the misallocation is proportional in our model uh, to the variance of rates of return across countries. And uh, we'll see that, um, uh, that it's, um, uh, you know, that, that in the data, that's what drives basically the 6% the that I mentioned. Okay, so we're going to propose a theory. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not a theorist, uh, I, although I consume theory. So I'll do my best to try to present some of the, some of the intricacies of what we present. One of the things that we do in the in the uh, in the model is we microfound um, uh, a um, gravity model for international finance, which turns out to be surprisingly difficult to do. So a lot of top people in international finance have tried to do that, and with mixed results. Probably the most famous uh, paper in that tradition was by uh, Eric Van Winkoop um, uh, in the Journal of International Economics, where uh, uh, he and his co-author derived a. a a foundation for gravity that turns out not to be terribly robust to small changes in, in how they model things. Um, but we will have a gravity equation that comes out after much work uh, and much effort to get that, but it happens. Uh, you know, one of the things that's kind of mysterious in international finance is that the gravity model works extremely well empirically. Uh, both the, the, the part of gravity that has to do with the size of the destination and origin country, but also the part about distance. Uh, and yet we don't really have a good uh, theoretical foundation. So I think we're still, uh, you know, the literature is still struggling with finding this foundation. And we're, you know, I'd say we have a modest proposal for, for how you could uh, how you could justify that. Uh, I think most of the uh, meat of the paper is in the empirics. So I'll try to spend most time on that. That's also my comparative advantage. Um, so the first step is to estimate this gravity equation. Uh, and we try to do it in a way that's kind of state of the art. So we're going to have you know, country of origin, country of destination, fixed effects, and we're going to be able to identify mostly the bilateral components there with a very broad uh, set of measures and controls. Different methods to account for the extensive and the intensive margin of, um, of gravity, uh, methods to account for the endogeneity of some of the right-hand side variables, uh, and then finally methods that look at different cuts of the data to look at different sub-components of um, subcomponents of um, international financial flows. And um, what, we, what we're also going to do is we're going to take the model seriously. So we're going to generate a bunch of 
uh, uh, distributions from the model, in particular the distribution of returns, and we're going to compare them uh, to uh, uh, returns distributions that others have uh, have generated to see how well the model uh, can match uh, stylized facts. And then finally, uh, one thing we're going to do is a set of counterfactuals. So we're going to say, let's take the coefficients from our gravity regression and let's change them. In other words, in particular, let's take the uh, uh, distance variables and set their uh, coefficients to zero as if they didn't have any uh, effect anymore on uh, global capital flows. And let's derive the global allocation of capital uh, under this counterfactual scenario to see uh, how much of a gain uh, in, <clears throat> in welfare we get from that, and also how much, of, uh, we, how much we can reduce inequality across countries uh, by, by zeroing out these, uh, these barriers. So I think this is the kind of slide which people always skip, and I'm going to do the same. Uh, there's a very big literature on all of these uh, aspects. One that's missing here is the whole literature on barriers that the political economy uh, crowd is usually most uh, familiar with because people have started to take seriously the idea that uh, long run divergence between societies have introduced uh, barriers to, to interactions between them. Um, but otherwise, you know, it's, it's sort of a very broad and far ranging literature, not, not surprising because the issue of capital misallocation you know, is a very important uh, issue for welfare. A variety of fields have been uh, concerned with this issue, uh, not just international finance. And, uh, and so that, that's reflected in the broad uh, swath of, of, of contributions that you see out there. Okay, Roman, so uh, can, I, can I ask a quick question? Uh, so uh, regarding the role of gravity in international finance, I guess, for our audience, which is not as well read, uh, is that an established fact? Is this Portis and Rate papers, uh, they have established it long time ago when you say the gravity works in, um, in uh, international finance, uh, but uh, it's not used as a workhorse model, the gravity model. Uh, what, is, what is the consensus on the literature? So I think the consensus is that empirically, when you run a regression of asset holdings, uh, either in stock or flows, on distance between origin and destination country uh, and the product of the GDPs of these countries, you tend to see very significant coefficients estimated. So I think that's fairly well established ever since Portis and Ray's 2005 paper. Um, uh, and, and I think that that's been, uh, in fact, there were papers even before we cite them in, the, in, in our paper, you know, starting in the late 90s. And I think that holds very well. And in the, the work Enrico and I had done prior to this paper, you know, just running these reduced form regressions, that's also what we found. So I'm quite convinced that that's, that's really there. Typically, uh, the way Portis and Ray justified these results was to appeal to sort of informational frictions. The idea was that information, it was harder to gain information about countries that were very distant uh, geographically and that those information frictions created home bias and that's why you saw gravity. Um, or proximity bias would be a, a generalization of just home bias. And uh, so, so I think that that's uh, the way it was rationalized but actually when you started to write a model it wasn't so easy to, uh, to get that outcome. Um, you know, the, the notion that no one uh, in France can know what's going on in Papua New Guinea uh, you know, it turns out, well, it, you know, you can find out <laughs> at relatively low cost. And, uh, and so, uh, so the, 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 uh, the approach that we adopt, you'll see, is, is based on rational inattention. So it's much more behavioral kind of approach where people can choose to get informed. And if they have biases or prejudices against very distant countries, they may choose not to incur the cost of learning. Uh, uh, and, and we micro found that that way. But you know, it's still an information story, and that's typically the story that people have told. Okay, so um, we're trying to do a sort of a workhorse general equilibrium model for uh, studying uh, gravity in international finance. Okay, so that very much like uh, Eaton Quartum, uh, you know, has been shown to be sort of a foundation for gravity in international trade. We're trying to come up with something similar, and in fact, it has a lot of uh, of similarities to, to, to the Eaton Corton model and from that perspective. Also very big differences because it's finance and not trade and, and they're very distinct uh, beasts. Okay, so every country, so there's N countries, uh, the destination is we're gonna call I, uh, the supplier or the origin country we're gonna call J, there's discrete time T. 
every country has a representative firm that produces a uh, homogeneous good uh, that can be consumed, reinvested, and traded. Um, uh, and, and we're going to have uh, fixed endowments of labor and natural resources that are immobile. The reason we have natural resources is largely so that we can uh, uh, have them in the empirics as well and match some of the Kazelian fires work on measuring the marginal product of capital. Then output is going to have two components. It's going to have a um, it's going to have a deterministic component, YIT, uh, that is basically a Cobb Douglas in capital, labor, and uh, materials or natural resources. And then it's also going to have a stochastic component, where this variable here, zeta, is going to have mean one, uh, and is going to be distributed log normally. And we're going to have uh, the reason we have zeta will be apparent in a second, but it's going to be uh, proportional to uh, both the capital uh, share and to uh, income. And what's that? What that's going to uh, give us, give us, given our assumption on timing, is that uh, capital is going to be the residual claimant on uh, on everything. So the whole brunt of the shock is going to be borne by capital. It's going to give us heterogeneity that way. Uh, uh, you know, which which you will see is it plays a plays an important role in the um, uh, in the decision to invest in different countries. So capital investors, as I just said, they're the residual claimants. So wages and natural rents are determined before uh, Zeta is realized. And, uh, and so the, the only uh, people who bear the brunt of Zeta are the, are, the capital, uh, are the capital investors. There's also going to be a capital tax. I, I'm gonna try to minimize the extent to which I talk about taxes. We have taxes modeled pretty extensively. We understand uh, these taxes as being incorporating also expropriation risk. Uh, so that's another. Uh, uh, another dimension here, and that finances a public good uh, queue that that people uh, consume in both in both periods, because it's an overlapping generation two period model. Then it's a very everything so far is extremely straightforward for uh, uh, you know for, for anyone who's uh, who's who's taken uh, you know marginal products uh, in the past. So the the rate of return to uh, uh, to uh, natural resources is. Uh, uh, you know, factor price is MIT, which is the, the marginal product of, uh, of natural resources. Wage is the same thing as usual. Uh, more important for us, because we're focusing on capital, uh, here, here's the rate of return to, uh, to capital. So the first one is the ex post tax inclusive net of taxes return to investors. That's the big R. Um, and uh, it's the marginal product of capital, uh, you know, once you've removed the taxes. Uh, and uh, and once you've uh, taken into account the shock, and then RIT, the little one, is going to be the um, expected rate of return. So that's the main thing that we're concerned with from the investor's perspective. The investor doesn't observe what the shock is. Uh, the investor does know what the tax rate is, but uh, the investor is going to be concerned with the ex ante uh, rate of return to capital, which is uh, obtained by taking the expectation of the big R. Uh, and here I've also removed the taxes, so this is the uh, this is the gross this is the gross return. Okay. Um, then uh, we have an overlapping generations model. So turning to to consumers and investors, uh, every period there's a continuum of agents, uh, and they they're born and they live for two periods. And so they 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 basically are uh, uh, work when they're young, and then they retire on their capital uh, income when they're uh, when they're uh, when they're old. Uh, they each have, uh, uh, well, they in aggregate are, have uh, LJ units of labor and they have uh, natural capital that they inherit from the previous generation. And they supply both factors inelastically. So there's no decisions there, no margin. The only decision here is on capital, uh, which gets complicated enough, so that's good. Um, so their earnings are, in the first period, are earnings from work and ownership of natural resources. So it's a uh, and X plus WL, and in period two, they retire on their capital income. Here's their utility function. They basically have a patient's uh, parameter theta that's going to play a role in our model. The higher is theta, the more people are going to save. So it's actually going to be pretty closely related to the savings rate. And then they consume, uh, you know, they have consumption in the first period, which is over here. They have consumption in the second period here. Uh, I'll say more about, uh, so theta, as I mentioned, is the patient's uh, parameter. Uh, I, I'll say more about uh, later on, it's the cost that they have to pay to acquire information on foreign markets, uh, which we include in their utility function. Uh, 
And then finally, there's the public good part, which is the D, the here, which is the utility that they derive in both periods uh, from consuming the public good. Because everything's separable, uh, both in terms of you know, the tax and, 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 uh, and public good decision, they're separable. We're not going to have any distortion uh, there other than on capital. Okay, so uh, the, the public goods, in other words, don't play a huge role in the, in the paper. You can think about them as kind of thrown away. Uh, 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 you know, and it's just the tax thing that we want to model. Okay, so here's uh, here's the, uh, uh, the what happens in steady state. So steady state is where uh, all the variables take constant values across time, and that's what we focus on. So this paper does not look at all at transition. We only look at steady states, and uh, you have this uh, this form of the um, uh, of uh, of aggregate savings, which is you know in dollar terms. So it's this share of total income. Okay, that depends on the patient's parameter uh, naturally, and it also depends on these um, uh, factor shares, the factor shares of labor and, and natural resources. Okay, so here's the real innovation in the model. So far, what I've said is a very standard general equilibrium uh, model, in fact, quite simple, uh, with, with very standard preferences and, 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 uh, and production structures. Where, where the model uh, sort of is a bit different is when it comes to information. So. Uh, we're going to have uh, investors who are the, the, the consumers that make their asset allocation decisions uh, under limited information about the expected returns. Because so they're going to have a prior, uh, and they're going to uh, uh, then generate. You know, they're going to be able to extract signals, uh, costly signals, in order to learn about the true distribution of returns. So the real object of interest here is this R tilde, which is the perceived returns that uh, uh, that investors have. Uh, and we're going to call their prior G, okay? So, uh, um, uh, you know, they, they, can, they, they, can, they can purchase essentially a signal about the distribution of returns uh, uh, with any distribution. So I should say, because the, the problem they face is very simple. There's a bunch of countries out there that each have a rate of return. And uh, the only problem that consumers have is they don't know what those rates of returns are. If they knew what the rates of returns uh, were, uh, they would invest all of their capital in the country that has the highest rate of return. Okay, so in this particular version of the model, it's a bit different. They will invest their capital in the market in which they perceive to have the highest rate of return, which may may or may not be the actual market that has the highest rate of return. Okay, uh, okay. So then they they base you know they're Bayesian. They update their to, to their posterior F, and the whole issue. Uh, of what we model is how do you go from G to F, you know, and what does that, that do to the perceived uh, to the perceived uh, um, distribution of returns R tilde. So uh, to get these signals about the distribution of returns, they're going to have to incur a utility cost. Uh, and we assume that the utility cost is essentially uh, proportional to how informative the signal is. Okay, so uh, if uh, you reduce, you know, if you, if you, if you, if basically the signal is extremely informative, um, uh, uh, then you're going to pay a high cost. And so this cost I that you saw in the utility function, it takes this form. Okay. So it has um, a sigma here. So if sigma is very high, essentially the cost is zero. Okay. If sigma is very low, uh, then the cost is prohibitive to, uh, um, uh, to, obtaining, to obtaining information about, uh, about the distribution of returns. So the investors are atomistic, and they're each going to choose one country to invest in. So because each country has you know, a continuum of investors, the country is actually going to have a portfolio. But each investor is not going to have a portfolio. Okay. So that's very different from usual portfolio stories based on risk. Uh, this is not a portfolio story based on risk. The, the objective for investors is to maximize their, uh, their net uh, return. So, uh, it's very standard result uh, in the literature that the, uh, uh, the, uh, the portfolio shares they're going to devote to each market. So this is the portfolio share invested in country I by people that come from country J. Okay? It's going to take this form, which comes from the logit formulation. And um, you can see that uh, you know, you're going to have an elasticity of substitution between assets of different countries, which is uh, you know, sigma, and, and you're going to have uh, um, um, uh, the probability, you know, the, the unconditional probability uh, uh, of investing in given markets uh, in there as well. So 
there's no known closed form solutions in general. Uh, um, but if you have, um, uh, we, we show in the paper, and that was one of Bruno's great achievements uh, after much work uh, showing that uh, uh, if you assume uh, that the prior has this distribution, then you can have a closed form solution for, uh, for the pi zeros for, uh, for these unconditional probabilities that takes this form. So the precision of the gamma distribution is, is this phi variable that's gonna be very important uh, and uh, you know the the the, the relative precision uh, uh, that you have from each market. So this is basically how precise is you know is your signal from market I if you come from country J uh, relative to the total is going to give you the shares, the, the example shares. So um, uh, there's two priors that you could have. So one prior that's kind of that turns out to be efficient. Uh, you know this is this is going to be an assumption. Would be to just invest uh, the share, uh, a, a share of your of your portfolio, uh, you know, at the country level, uh, in proportion to how big the other country's capital stocks are. Okay, so let's say you know France has uh, you know uh, five percent of the world capital stock, then all the investors around the world are going to invest five percent of their portfolio in France. Or a more precise way to say this is every country of origin is going to invest five percent of their portfolio in France. So that's the sort of uh, uh, you know the sort of benchmark result. Uh, what we assume instead is that instead of doing this, uh, investors are going to um, have a precision that depends on the distance. So the idea is that the cost of obtaining signals from very distant locations is going to be increasing uh, in distance, basically. So that's how we introduce distance. So you can see already that gravity based on size you have from the efficient. Uh, assumption. Uh, you get that you will invest more in larger countries. And you will also have more to invest if you are yourself large. So the product of uh, GDPs will matter uh, through this channel. What we add to this that gives us gravity with respect to distances is, uh, is the fact that this information acquisition cost is, uh, is harder to, uh, to uh, you know, is, is higher when you're acquiring information about very distant countries. And this is natural. I mean, we think that you know, if you are Portugal, you know, it might be harder to uh, uh, to gain uh, uh, information about uh, uh, Papua New Guinea than it would be about Brazil. So in this case, it would be an example where D is cultural distance, you know, uh, and and you're just you know, it's just easier for a variety of reasons. Maybe it has to do with ling linguistic distance or uh, understanding or having had a common history or maybe simply with physical distance. We're going to consider all of these as, as possibilities. So this dependence of the prior on distances is, is what's going to give us informational advantage. Uh, uh, in other words, you're going to have an informational advantage uh, uh, in acquiring information about countries that are close to, uh, to your own. So you know, I kind of gave you the intuition for why we have gravity, but we show also, uh, we show also that you get gravity uh, formally, so you can figure out the portfolio shares uh, in this case, it's actually not uh, written in terms of shares. A is actually the asset ownership in dollars, okay? And it has this uh, it has this gravity form. You can see the gravity here. You've got the product of, of the two GDPs up here in the numerator, and uh, in the denominator, you've got the uh, uh, you've got the distances there. So it's very much exactly what you get in gravity and trade. All right, so that's that's what we have uh, uh, that's what we have here in terms of, of the gravity. So um, uh, we're, we're going to look at some efficiency results because ultimately we're going to want to do not really welfare analysis, but at least analysis on distortions on GDP. And um, so if, if beta is zero, that's where you get essentially efficiency in this model. The only inefficiency comes from the, from the friction to international capital flows. And um, uh, we're going to say that uh, uh, for, for every world capital, we're going to sh we show that it's easy to see that for every world capital stock, there's a unique uh, allocation of capital across the world that is efficient. Um, so there's no informational uh, uh, advantage. And if all assets markets are in equilibrium, uh, all origin countries are going to hold uh, identical portfolios of foreign assets, meaning their shares of, uh, uh, of each destination market are going to be the same across, across, all, dest across all origin. Um, and then the other thing uh, that you get is that the rates of return across the world are equalized in a world like
inputs. And in, in our model, what you get is that uh, if you're in an efficient, uh, 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 you know, outcome, all the re rates of return are, are equalized. Um, and then, uh, you know, capital is allocated efficiently, meaning you've achieved the highest. Uh, so here, efficiency means maximizing world GDP. Okay, so um, uh, you can actually show by taking a Taylor approximation around the, uh, the, the, the efficient equilibrium that uh, the deadweight loss that you have from capital misallocation in this model is proportional to the variance of the rates of return. So the bigger the dispersion of the rates of return, the more you're going to have, or, you know, the bigger the distortion you're going to have. So in order, so in other words, uh, you know, uh, in order to get any uh, uh, misallocation in this paper, you need uh, variation in uh, rates of return. So I'm going to spend a lot of time in in, in the la in the second half, uh, you know, talking about uh, uh, the dispersion and the rates of return. Um, so we we just need that variation in rates of return for it to, to make sense. Roman, before we move to yeah. empirics, there is a question on chat from Pavel Molchanov. Um, uh, you have uh, in the, your gravity equation that you obtain the power for both y, y i and y j is one, so you don't have a home bias at all, right? Um, you don't have a home bias, except if you you know. So it depends a little bit on the structure of what the distance is here. Um, you will see that actually, uh, as, uh, you know, so that's a very good question, first of all. You, so the, the distance introduces home, bi home bias or at least proximity bias. And how you parameterize the distance might, uh, uh, you know, so for example, if you treat uh, the domestic country very as having much lower distances than, than the rest of the world, then you'll have home bias. We don't do that in the empirics. We have conventional measures of distance. Uh, so you're at a distance of zero to yourself, of course, along all of these measures of distance, but uh, 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 that's enough to generate uh, the degree of home bias we actually observe in the data. So, uh, uh, you know, hold that thought until I show you the, uh, you know, how home bias lines up uh, in the model, because it lines up really well. Um, okay. Um, so it's, I guess the answer is you do have home bias through the distances. So you know you can uh, take logs of our gravity equation, and this is what you get. Uh, uh, it's very much conventional uh, uh, compared to the trade literature. Uh, you get basically uh, that the log of asset holdings depends on a country of origin fixed effect, country of destination fixed effect, which is alpha i. Uh, and then, uh, you know, beta times the distances here, uh, where the distances can be anything you want. Uh, we're going we're gonna to actually have three distances in our empirics. Now, when it comes to A, you know, there, there's a lot of progress that's been made in measuring asset holdings across borders. We're going to look at stock measures of asset holdings across borders. Uh, uh, we're going to have, uh, you know, both uh, stocks holdings from I to J and J to I. So we're going to have an N by N kind of matrix. Uh, um, um, and, and importantly, both of our measures, when it comes to FDI and foreign portfolio investment, are going to be restated to account for uh, the existence of uh, tax havens. You know, so a lot of foreign investment uh, uh, you know, is mediated by places like the Cayman Islands, in which you have shell companies that funnel uh, the investment for tax reasons. And uh, some authors, it's not us, but we take their data. Uh, recently, you know, in the last couple of years, have restated the, the investment data to take that into account. Because, you know, otherwise the Cayman Islands would look like an incredibly frequent uh, source of capital. And obviously that's not what's going on. So we use these restated things in the appendix we have an exercise where you use the non-restated uh, 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 figures. It doesn't matter a whole lot, but it's better to use the restated ones. We're also going to rejig the data a little bit. So we're, we're, we're interested in making a distinction between equity and debt. And the data come uh, as FDI, which is all equity, and foreign portfolio investment, which mixes equity and debt. We're going to extract the debt portion of foreign portfolio investment and add up the two equity uh, measures to get a measure of equity investment and debt investment. We're also going to have total assets, and we're also going to have FDI and FPI separately. 
I think the reason why we do uh, this is that the distinction between FDI and FPI has come under a lot of criticism. Uh, you know, there's this arbitrary 10% uh, cutoff where we consider things to be an FDI investment, which is sort of arbitrary and not really well founded. So we're, we're trying to shy away from this distinction. When it comes to the Ds, the distance metrics, we, we're going to have three uh, geographic distance, which is the, the usual one. Uh, linguistic distance, which you know we worked a lot. I've worked a lot with with Enrico and other co-authors uh, over the years in trying to better measure. We're going to use a measure from Jim Theron, and then cultural distance, which is a measure Enrico and I came up with a few years ago uh, in, in the context of another project where we looked at um, uh, you know distance, basically Euclidean distance based on uh, answers to the World Value Survey. So we're going to take each country. We're going to look at uh, the, the average answers to the World Value Survey, and we're going to look at the distance in these answers uh, across pairs of countries. That's going to be a measure of uh, cultural distance. And another work, Enrico and I have shown that um, this measure is highly correlated with uh, other measures of, uh, of cultural distance you might think of, you know, our famous genetic distance measure, but also uh, linguistic distance, religious distance, all of those things are highly correlated with. Uh, this direct thing that you observe from the World Value Survey. Um, we were trying to look for measures that would have a cont contemporary effect okay, and, and, uh, and to take the, the more historically determined ones like religious distance uh, you know, and, and use them as instruments. We're also going to have a lot of control variables there. Um, uh, so we made some choices as to what we call the barrier and what we didn't call a barrier. The barriers are these three things. That's what we're going to play with. Uh, in principle, you could do other things you could say, Imagine that I, uh, you know, went back in history and eliminated all colonial relationships, or if I could eliminate trade costs, uh, uh, or if I could have every country, you know, have a, a single currency, et cetera, what would be the effect on financial flows? And in principle, you could do that. We, don't, we just don't do that. We don't do counterfactuals with respect to these controls. We only do counterfactuals with respect to the three uh, main ones. Um, so as an IV for cultural distance, we're going to use religious distance, which turns out, you know, has a very strong first stage. The argument there is a lot of the uh, of the values that are measured in the cultural distance measure reflect, uh, you know, religious values. So do you believe in God? Do you believe in the afterlife, et cetera? Uh, and religious distance, in contrast, is just a purely sort of it comes from cladistics. It's basically based on trees, you know. So you know, you say Protestants and Catholics are closer. Uh, uh, to each other than Catholics are to Muslims, and Catholics and Muslims are closer to each other than they are to, say, Buddhists, and it's based on these, uh, on these trees. Um, uh, and so it really reflects the splits in religions that have occurred, uh, you know, uh, far in the past and not, uh, not anything, and not surprisingly, that's correlated with actual values that people have, including religious values. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so the, the, the reason we think that's excludable uh, is uh, that, you know, the, the only way these uh, historical splits um, between world religions affect, uh, you know, current investment patterns is through their effect on current values that people actually have, controlling for all the other uh, observables that we have. It turns out not to matter very much. So. Uh, mostly what you get from instrumenting for cultural distance is you get a bigger effect of cultural distance. So we, we underplay that a little bit. We don't even use the IV as the baseline coefficients for our calibrations. Uh, we're going to use OLS because they're more conservative, they're smaller. Um, when it comes to country data, it's very standard. You know, we get uh, from the Penwell tables, we get all the standard variables. From the World Bank, we get the cap share of natural capital, which we need to get our, uh, our rates of return. Um, uh, taxes, so let me go a little bit fast on this. Taxes have two components. We have a tax rate, and we also have a uh, probability of expropriation, uh, which is there. When it comes to tax rates, we take into account a whole bunch of different taxes. And that was a lot of work to get uh, country level data on this and to aggregate it into a single tax rate. Um, and then, uh, or, you know, PR is just based on these surveys, uh, uh, you know, that give a score that ranges from zero to 10 on expropriation risk. Okay, so let me tell you a bit about the, 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 uh, the, uh, the model. So, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have several benchmarks. Uh, one benchmark is zero gravity, where you have, um, uh, where, where you have basically zero barriers. Another benchmark is one in which 
each country would invest, uh, uh, you know, uh, to each destination uh, a share of their portfolio that corresponds to the share of the destination's capital stock in world capital. That's what we call the ball, balls and bins uh, kind of model. Um, okay, so um, uh, you can have these three basic benchmarks, uh, you know, uh, the actual model, uh, the, um, actually we, ha we have a fourth, which is called the residual model. Let me, let me just show, uh, uh, show that later. So, so here's what happens when you compare uh, portfolio shares uh, between the actual model and the one uh, that is frictionless, okay, that has zero gravity. So if, if you have zero gravity, remember every origin country invests the same share of their portfolio in, in each destination country. Okay, so that's why you have these vertical lines here. Uh, it's because each country invests the same share in the destination. You see that there's a, a positive correlation between what we actually observe and what the frictionless model predicts, but it's not, uh, not a perfect correlation. Um, here's what you have uh, when we look at the actual portfolio shares in the data and the portfolio shares from the, the, the fitted model. Okay, so that's the fitted, uh, that's the gravity model that's been uh, fitted. Uh, and, and you can see we, we do quite well at explaining, uh, uh, you know, the model fit is quite good. That's a, that's a measure of the R squared, I guess, is, is, is one way to see it. Um, this is in terms of portfolio shares and not in terms of uh, assets themselves. Okay? So not in dollar terms, but in terms of shares. Um, now you can look at other measures of fit. So let me pick uh, one or two. Uh, you know, if, if you look at uh, the return on capital, for example, the standard deviation in the data is uh, 0.465. The, the way we get the return on capital in the data is we uh, uh, you know, apply the Caselli and fire um, uh, methodology to uh, the Penwell tables uh, exactly the way they do it for 2017. Okay, so it's a different base here that we have compared to them. It turns out to play a big role. So if you apply their method to 2017, you get a substantial uh, standard deviation of rates of return, which remember is really crucial in our model. And then if you get the same thing from our baseline model, so instead of doing the Kazelian fire methodology applied directly to the, to the data, you take our model, look at the implied rates of return given the estimates that we have on, uh, on, on the, on, on the um, gravity model, uh, you, you get a slightly higher standard deviation uh, of returns. Okay. Now, of course, if you have a frictionless model, remember if there's no barriers at all, all the rates of return are equalized across countries. So that's why you have this zero here um, in, a, in, a, in a version of our model with no frictions, you have no, DV, no, no, uh, no distortion, there's no, no misallocation. Okay, you know, you, you know the other uh, things match pretty well, you know, the standard error of capital per employee. Again, you know, in a frictionless model, you can already see our result from the counterfactual here. You know, the standard deviation of capital per employee is much smaller uh, than what you would have uh, uh, you know, under a world with, with borders. Um, and that, that's, you know, well, you'll see the intuition for that, but it's basically countries that are at the periphery of world capital markets, you know, tend to be very distant, both culturally and, and geographically. Uh, and so as a result of that, they are left in the dark, you know, they're left in the lurch, they don't get enough capital. And, uh, and so that's what makes their, uh, their, they're too poor, you know, compared to what you would have in a, uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a world with no frictions. So, so very distant uh, culturally and geographically countries, you know, they're kind of discriminated against more uh, in this model. If you want to call it discrimination, I don't know, it's the modern word way to phrase things. Um, okay, uh, another thing is you would have no home bias. In other words, you would invest the share of capital that corresponds to the share of the country if you had a frictionless model. But in the baseline model, you do have, uh, you know, home bias. This is our measure of home bias. It's sort of the deviation between the actual portfolio share, uh, so either data or model implied, and the one that you would get if you have a share of the portfolio that were just the share of the capital in the aggregate world capital stock. And so each destination country I has a capital stock KI, and KI divided by K, that, that, that gives you the, uh, uh, its share in the world capital stock. So that's the benchmark, right? So if, if everyone invests you know, a share of the capital stock, you, you get uh, 
you're in the frictionless world. So in a frictionless world, you know, there's there's uh, the home bias would be zero. Uh, this measure would be would be zero. Okay. Um, let me just uh, maybe skip over that because uh, uh, these graphs, these figures are nicer to look at. This is home bias, so it's the same measure of home bias I just discussed. Uh, pi, you know, log pi minus log ki over k, and we, here we compare what's implied by the model. Okay, so we generate these this measure from the model. And we compare it to what we see in the data. And you can see a very, very tight relationship. So that's the, in answer to the question that was asked in the chat, you know, we don't per se have, uh, you know, we don't really treat the home country very differently, except it's at a distance of zero to itself. And yet we're able to replicate home bias pretty well with this model. Uh, that's one, one of the successes there. When you look at um, the, so another thing is that poor countries tend to high, have higher returns in on. Uh, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is actually all data. Uh, you know, the return to capital RI, which is what you uh, get from, uh, I believe that's from the Kazilian fire methodology applied to 2007. And you plot it against log GDP per employee, you see this negative and pretty strong negative correlation. You can see a lot of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, very poor and also have very high, uh, you know, sort of ex ante rates of return to capital. Um, Roman, uh, so when you say correlation, so for example, in this chart, uh, rho is 77 or rho is minus 0.63. This is just cross country across those dots you're showing us, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the correlation. In, that's this line. Yes, it's the correlation uh, in, this, in, this, in this graph. So, and, and both of those come from. Can I ask a, can I ask a, especially also, data, there is right? a question so, from Orkan, or Orkan, Orkan Asaka is asking if. Uh, if you drop home countries themselves, would uh, uh, would uh, would the model perform similarly? If you if you drop II home country pairs, um, there's two answers to this. So first of all, we do not use any data on II. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all of so for example, for home bias. We don't use any data on investment in the domestic country, which we observe from the Penwell tables. We only use the model implied investment. So the home bias uh, that I showed you was entirely based, you know, the model implied the home bias that I showed you is entirely based on the model uh, when it comes to the diagonals. Here, this is the country level rate of return. So there's no II really. The, um, I'm not sure how, how I would do this. Uh, you know, th this is the basic. I think I think the answer to this question is you already dropped uh, II uh, investment because you don't have II investment. So. Yeah, we, we on purpose don't use II investment. I'll show you actually what happens when you compare model implied investment to actual investment. Uh, uh, maybe I'll show you, maybe it's in the paper. And we have this very nice matrix where we have the whole, or actually not the whole, but for a selected number of countries because to fit it on the page, uh, uh, portfolio shares, and what we, we get a very big diagonal from this, even though we don't use any data on, on, uh, on, on home investment to get that. Okay, so it's all derived from the, from the model. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but maybe the, the, the answer will come a bit later, so maybe hold that thought. Uh, so this is the relationship between return on capital and home bias. And it shouldn't be surprising, like the countries that have high home bias should have high returns to capital because they are more insulated. You know, they have, they have these higher, bigger barriers toward the rest of the world. Okay, so, and that's exactly what you see very strongly. Okay, so that was sort of model fit, you know, it was to convince you that the model actually manages to replicate a lot of the facts that we see in the, in the raw data or, or not so raw data when it comes to returns, you actually have to do some work to get them, but. Uh, uh, but basically, um, or, or, you know, data implied as opposed to model implied. So um, the next step, and I guess you know, I have only ten minutes, so it's good because I'll manage to to, to finish before we we go to questions. Uh, when we when we move to zero gravity, that means we take all the betas and make them zero. Um, we get an increase in world GDP that's about five point nine percent. So that's the six percent I gave you early early on. If you remove the um, uh, uh, information frictions a lot. So, sorry, sorry, I misspoke. So in the first counterfactual, you remove all the betas 
and you make all the taxes uniform. Because okay, so all the countries have the same rate of taxation, tau i. So that removes both the policy frictions and the information friction. Remember that we're not estimating the tau i, right? We just plug them in the model. So there's no elasticity or anything to estimate. The only elasticities that we estimate in the model are the, the distance, the, the betas. Uh, so anyway, if you, if you make taxes uniform and you zero out all the barriers, world GDP increases by 6%. If you remove uh, the betas alone, but you keep the policy barriers or the taxes, uh, the GDP loss is almost the same. And if you um, remove only the policy frictions and you keep in place the information frictions, the GDP loss is only about 1.3%. Bottom line is that all of the action here is on the barriers and not on the policy. Not all of the action, but most of the action. And also the interaction. But, but, yeah, but, uh, sorry, sorry. but yeah. your policy frictions also include expropriation risks, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. They do. Um, the, 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 you know, and the, but the, they're multiplicative, right? So they, they basically reduce the return to capital net, the net return of, to capital just in the conventional way. Uh, tau times K, you know, uh, tau times R gives you the net of uh, tax return. So we don't need to estimate anything. We just multiply by whatever we calculated the taxes to be, and uh, and and we can get the distortion from taxes that way. So, so just because again, you know, taxes affect the distribution of returns to the extent it changes the distribution of returns. In proportion to that, it's going to give us misallocation. Uh, okay. So the the end the end result of that is probably the differences in taxes across countries. Uh, don't change the distribution of returns that dramatically. Okay. Um, in fact, if, if every country had the same tax rate, uh, the distribution of returns would be unchanged. That would be the efficient outcome, actually. If you had no information frictions and all the taxes were uniform, you would be in the, inf uh, in the efficient outcome. And the reason it's efficient is because the public good doesn't distort any decision here. It's all entirely separable. Um, that's, that's a model feature. I mean, we're, we're, you know, I'm not... Yeah, I don't personally take that very serious. Uh, I, I do think that taxes and spending have distorted that. Um, so taxes interact with other frictions. So what you see here is that actually, if you isolate the information frictions, you get almost the same distortion, right? Uh, so that means there's some multicollinearity between taxes and, and distances. You know, perhaps the more distant countries also have higher taxes. And so, yeah, something like that is going on. Um, uh, so and it's also a second best problem, right? So you have the information friction and you have the taxes. It's not obvious that harmonizing all the taxes across the world will actually uh, improve things, given that you have this other distortion present. Um, what we can show and we do in the model is that you can set taxes so that you offset the distortion from informational advantage. So you think about, uh, you know, uh, setting a lower tax rate uh, in places that are very distant and you know, have a very big informational disadvantage and a higher tax rate in places that are close to the core of where the investors are all located, because of the US and Europe, et cetera. And then if you do that, then you can offset the thing and you can get back to the efficient equilibrium. It'd be pretty hard to do because you'd need to measure precisely the information frictions, which I guess we do, but you'd have to take that very seriously. Okay, so here's comparing the zero gravity uh, uh, version of the model, so no barriers and no taxes to the observed equilibrium when it comes to the distribution across the world of capital per employee. And what you see is, of course, the mean is uh, moved to the uh, right a little bit, but more importantly, the dispersion is much, uh, much smaller. And so we have a, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but I think when it comes to capital per employee, it's on the order of the standard deviation is reduced by about 70%. Um, when you look at income inequality, which is GDP per employee, you get a similar picture. So again, you know, the mean is moved to the right by about 6%, as you know, but then more importantly, the, the, uh, the, distor the, the distribution is, is, is squeezed and it, it has pretty big effects on the lower tail of the distribution. You know, all of this lower tail kind of disappears. Um, uh, okay, so, so that's the, 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 those are the results on inequality. Um, when it comes to capital reallocation, um, what you see is that the poorest countries, uh, you know, tend to have uh, the highest change in capital per employee. So another way to say this is that 
what removing the barrier does is capital poor countries get a whole lot more capital, which makes their rate of return go down and you know, in an efficient equilibrium, they, they should all be equalized. So you can see like the, the effects are pretty dramatic for, uh, for, for countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Also, another thing of note is that countries like India and China that are very large, and we think that has to do with their size and the gravity equation, uh, you know, tend to have lower benefits. Like in some cases, they even lose capital despite being uh, relatively poor. So China is not so poor, but it's so big, it actually loses a little bit of capital uh, because, you know, that's how, that's how uh, home bias works, right? It's got a lot of home bias, which would disappear. They would start to invest a lot more abroad, okay? Um, and India is just about at zero. Uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't make too much of the fact that it's below the line. Uh, I gave this talk several times in India uh, or, uh, you know, on Zoom, but with an audience located in India and uh, they were freaked out. What do you mean? You know, we should close our capital markets. <laughs> you know? I'm like, no, no, that's not the implication. It's just, uh, it's gravity. So, you know, size really matters here. Um, um, also net positions. So what you see is, so this is the Lucas, uh, this is the Lucas paradox. Okay, so if you have a zero gravity counterfactual, this line represents uh, how much investment, you know, how, whether you have a positive or a negative investment position, depending on your GDP per employee or your per capita income. And what you see is that if you had zero gravity, suddenly you would start, uh, you, you would see rich countries uh, have a very positive net capital position. So they would invest a lot in the rest of the world and all the poor countries would receive a ton of capital and then have a negative net capital position. They'd receive more than they, and they send out, uh, which you don't see in either the baseline model with the frictions or in the actual data. So in the actual data, it's not that rich countries, you know, receive money from poor countries on, on net. It's pretty much zero, right? So the Lucas critique is not why do, the Lucas, the Lucas paradox is not why do poor countries invest so much in rich countries, that's not it. It's why do rich countries don't invest enough in poor countries. And so you see that, like it, it should be a lot more, but it's not. And we think it's because of the, of the barriers and the frictions. Okay, so I'm running out of time. So let me just, we did a whole bunch of extensions. Um, we added trade frictions to the model. Uh, we added capital controls uh, by using measures of existing capital controls. Uh, we looked at uh, volatility of stock markets as a measure of risk because we don't have real risk in our model. We looked at currency hedging costs to see if currency was one of the reasons. All of those things are in the appendix and they don't really change the um, bottom line much. The only thing that changes the bottom line is you get a slightly bigger distortion, uh, you know, about seven or seven and a half percent of world GDP becomes the distortion if you add trade frictions. So that's the main, the main thing. So there's some interaction between trade and finance that gives you that. Uh, I, I really don't feel very confident going beyond just stating that. Uh, I'm not sure what the nature of that interaction is, but it's, uh, you know, it's still still in the ballpark of, you know, we, we don't get 20% distortion, nor do we get, you know, zero distortion. It's always around six or 7%. Um, okay, so takeaways, you know, we have a model that micro founds gravity in international finance, which is really, uh, you know, has proven to be a challenge in the literature. We show that policy barriers and information barriers jointly exert a major influence on investment. They distort the allocation of capital globally, and they help rationalize some of the empirical facts about the uh, international investment network, in particular home bias, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that other models haven't rationalized in a unified framework. The steady state uh, capital misallocation is about 6% of world GDP, but more importantly, there's significant implications for world, uh, for cross-country inequality. And uh, I guess that, well, that that's that's the that's the final slide. Uh, one other thing that we say in the paper, let me just conclude with that, is that our paper doesn't really have much of an implication on whether you want to adopt, whether you want to dismantle capital controls and let money flow in unregulated, because we look at the steady state. Okay, so think about this as over the long run, these countries would be better off if these barriers to capital investment were lifted, both policy barriers, but more importantly, the sorts of biases and, and uh, uh, you know, distortions that come from information barriers. That doesn't mean you know, that in a short run framework, you know, letting capital flow, especially short-term 
hot capital flow, uh, you know. So I just want to you know, give a word of caution. This is not a paper that endorses uh, complete, uh, you know, uh, free capital flows across the world. It has this flavor for the long run, but one has to be careful about prudential policy in the short run. Thank you very much, uh, Roman, uh, for being uh, exactly on time. Um, so for people who want to ask questions, please raise your hand. I see one raised hand. Uh, before going to Ani, please just uh, just for you to, for, for the audience to know, please raise your hands and I'll give you the floor. Uh, let me abuse my uh, privilege as a chair. So one of the things which I was thinking about regarding political economy, so you have a very important political economy um, um, parameter, which is expropriation risk, which is part of your taxes. Now that is I uh, specific things. This is a country specific thing, not country pair specific thing. Yeah. And in principle, you can imagine the situation where expropriation is also dependent or contingent on cultural differences, on whatever linguistic proximity. And uh, in that yeah. sense, um, uh, is that is that the case that in a sense you already capture part of expropriation that is related to part of expropriation risk variation across variation uh, expropriation risk which is pairwise contingent is that is that something how we think about this or yeah uh, yeah I think so because the way our information in de facto the way our information predictions <clears throat> work is that they reduce the ex ante uh rate of return so the little r till you know the, the prior is what's reduced by the by the information friction and the reason is you don't acquire signals about very distant countries because they're more expensive to acquire and that's the same as having uh, a higher expropriation risk that's bilateral between country i and country j so uh, because the way the way the country specific and the way the country specific expropriation risk enters is multiplicatively it's just the same as a tax. It just reduces your, again, you know, your your post tax return. It just reduces that. So I think it's isomorphic. So I think I think your your point is uh, is well taken, and maybe that's why we find a small uh, effect of uh, removing the policy barriers on world uh, income. But but I would say it depends on your view of expropriation risk. You know, the, the thing that we're you know when when uh, I don't know what, what what is the appropriate example right now. I suppose that uh, all of the sanctions against Russia right now, you know, and the expropriation of yachts and things like that, that's like bilateral, like they're specific to, uh, um, uh, to some pairs, but not others. But there's also like a country level, I think there's, you, you'd agree with me, there's a fixed effect in, in expropriation risk also. Yeah, of course. Uh, Ani Aratunyan has a question, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Sergey. can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Romain, for the presentation. It's always nice to hear about research coming from you to find out what else cultural differences impede. Thank you. Here it is. So uh, I have a question actually about the cultural distance measurements you are using uh, myself. I'm tackling these questions in my own research. Uh, I understand the use of uh, the, the desire to use contemporary measures. The problem I see with them is that, for example, if you use world value survey, it changes over time, there is variation. And uh, I would like you to comment how you deal with it. I know you previously used uh, genetic distances as proxy for cultural differences. And I wonder why you didn't do it here in this, in this paper. Uh, second question I, I have, it's about uh, aggregating the all kinds of cultural traits together and building one uh, cultural distance measures across countries. I wonder whether there is any interest, like research interests of actually disaggregating it and looking through the cultural traits to find out which cultural traits uh, has a stronger effect. In particular, when I look, okay, there's like a component of national identity. Yeah. So is it like that nationalist countries like to invest on each other and globalist countries like to invest yeah. on each other and not other way around? And the third question I have is about the IV, probably is going to be the most questionable part of the research as it usually is in economics research. So uh, you use uh, religious distances. I've never seen this used as an IV for cultural differences before, but uh, totally makes sense to me. Um, 
I wonder why not to use also, I mean, the alternatives that has been used in the literature before as I mean, for cultural differences like differences in blood types or genetic distance itself. Uh, so these are the questions again, I'm tackling my own research and I would love to uh, hear about your approaches. Thank you. Thank you, these are great questions. I might have to ask you to, to remind me, uh, you know, because there, there were three. Uh, um, but your, your first one was on the use of, uh, on the variation across time of the World Bank Survey. Yeah, so what we're trying to do is to capture the first, you know, maybe the, the most persistent part. So we've averaged all of the waves in this particular case. So we don't look, you know, we've taken all the waves since the early eighties of the World Bank Survey and we've uh, taken, we, we, aggregate, we basically aggregate them. We take, we extract, a set of common questions across countries, and we uh, uh, look at all the answers uh, to those questions without regard for time. But I completely agree with you that in principle, you know, first of all, we might want to focus on the, you know, all of the exercises that I showed you was for 2017, and we might want to focus on the answers that have to do with, with that date, and that's a fair point. This is more of a sort of proof of concept than, than anything else, you know, uh, when it comes to the actual implementation of, of this. Uh, why not genetic distance? You know, we, we had it originally. You, you know that we did because, you know, that's what we do. Um, but we, you know, conceptually speaking, the things that are historically determined, uh, we wanted to keep as instruments and the things that were contemporary, we wanted to use as measures of the actual uh, informational distortion. So that's why we don't use it as a regressor. It works if you do. <laughs> um, uh, but I think it'd be more uh, more appropriate as an instrument, uh, simply because uh, it's it's historically determined, and the only, you know it's reasonable to assume the only way it works is by introducing differences in views, values, etc. between uh, between people. Uh, in the end, we settled for religious distance. It, uh, you know, they both work. The first stage. You know, we have a paper called Ancestry, Language, and and uh, Culture with Enrico that looks at the pattern of cross correlations between all these measures. That's actually the paper where we developed uh, uh, the measure of uh, world value survey distance. So you can look at that and you'll see that they're all, you know, the, the first stages are all very strong. Um, why did we use, so uh, there's a paper by Helfman and Melitz in the QJE a few years ago in trade uh, that used uh, religious, uh, uh, religion as an instrument. Uh, and so that's kind of why we favored huh. We favored that. That's the precursor to ours. Uh, it's also with Jonah Rubinstein, I think that paper, uh, third co-author, let me not forget him. Uh, at any rate, yeah, so that, that's why we did that. Uh, the, the, you know, you'll, if you look at ancestry, language, and culture, you'll see that we subdivide uh, the World Value Survey Index into uh, components. So the, the uh, World Value Survey has, uh, I don't know, eight or nine categories of questions. You, know, you mentioned nationalism, et cetera. There's one on morals, et cetera, et cetera. And these aggregate sets of questions, and you can look at, uh, and we do, you know, not for this paper, but in the other paper, we looked at the uh, relationship between these things uh, among themselves. They tend to be positively correlated. So if you're distant in one dimension, you're also distant in another, but these correlations aren't perfect. So you can, you can, you can play around with that. That's certainly true. And I think you had a third, but I, uh, I don't remember now. Yeah, no, Sid, thank oh, you very much. Okay. Yeah, that, these were the three questions, actually. Or, Orkun uh, next, uh, and then Pavel. Orkun, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Sergey, uh, and thanks, Romain, for the very interesting paper. As you said, there is very little theory, actually. I myself worked on, on home bias in the past, uh, and you know, uh, I think the literature is suffering from lack of theory, so it's a very uh, nice contribution in that sense, for sure. Uh, I was wondering, uh, since you have kind of attributed most of the role to the informational frictions, um, I was wondering whether you also try to differentiate, you know, how this role changes over normal periods versus crisis periods. Because, I mean, just kind of, you know, taking back to my research, when I was looking at the Eurozone crisis, for instance, and I'm looking at, like, for instance, I looked at very, you know, straightforward assets such as sovereign bonds, where, you know, information frictions should play very, very little role. But then, you know, what I found was actually the, the usual informational frictional channels gets aggravated during times of crisis. And I attributed that, for instance, to the role that soft information may play at, in those times. Because, you know, when there is a crisis, it's not just that, you know, it's not just the GDP uh, over, you know, the debt over GDP ratio of the country that determines whether the country is going to go bankrupt or not. Or, the, the, you know, there are more, you know, softer political, let's say, you know, concerns, restrictions, and, you know, the, the, the trade-offs, which you must be familiar a bit yourself. Yeah. 
itself as, as an investor to kind of, you know, sort out the true uh, probability of, of bankruptcy. So in that sense, have you tried to differentiate, uh, you know, how your model, um, you know, uh, plays out in crisis versus non-crisis? We have not, not, not so far. Uh, we have, um, so everything I've shown you in the counterfactual exercise, et cetera, is for 2017. Although in past versions of the paper, we, we had, you know, uh, you know, things averaged over a, a bigger period of time, et cetera. Partly it's for data quality reasons. That's where we think the data is the best. It's also a year where you didn't have like huge outliers, like, uh, you know, major capital outflows from Turkey, you know, uh, uh, or things like that that occurred. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so it seems like, you know, it was like a, a year that kind of could be representative of a steady state in a, in a sense, in that sense. But you're absolutely right, you know, out of, out of steady state, you know, how would the model react would be important. And applying this, you know, and doing this exercise for different years is really important. One of the big uh, aspects of Caselli and Fire is they, they, I don't remember what year it was, I think 2007 was their data. Uh, and it turns out it's very important. So people have shown, and it's not us, but people, for, for example, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the David and all paper that, I, that we cite on dispersion and rates of return, it turns out that if you do Kazillion fire for, for, for other years beside 2007, which was the year before the global financial crisis, you get quite different uh, distributions of returns. Uh, and so there's a debate, you know, trying not to be, we're, we're very much on the side of like, there are dispersions and rates of return because there'd be no paper our paper basically would not exist if there were no distortions in rates of return. So, uh, it, it, you know, if Francesco, who's an old friend of mine, ends up being the referee for this paper, we're toast. But uh, that's just something we have to live with. Uh, but but we, we're not really interested in, in, in entering into the debate as to why Gazillion Fire, you know, or whether it's true or whether it's not robust or, or we're not really going there. Um, uh, we just, we, 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 you know, our model implies that you have no distortions, that there are no uh, dispersions in the rates of return. So to the extent that you, uh, you know, that these crises, you know, they increase the dispersion in rates of returns, it's perfectly possible that you could get bigger distortions or if it changes the distribution in another way, uh, I completely take your point. We, we don't do it. Thanks, uh, question by Pavel. Pavel, please go ahead. Hello, uh, Roman. Uh, thank you very much again for your, for your presentation. I have two short questions. The first one is naive and conceptual. Um, when I think about um, capital flows, for example, from European Union to Africa, I don't think that it's the capital flows by individual, but by uh, corporations and banks. Yes. So uh, why? And I was um, amused that here cultural differences and language differences would play the role because why don't they just hire uh, financial intermediaries to remove this barrier? Great. And the second yeah. question, if you want to reply immediately. Yeah, I think so. I, I think... It's better to reply right away, otherwise it's yeah. not. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're actually in the paper, in the appendix, we have an extension where we show that our information friction barrier uh, is, ex you know, is exactly, um, uh, you know, gives you exactly the same results uh, if you instead assume that you have intermediation costs. All that we need mm -hmm. is that the cost of hiring the intermediary, which is your alternative modeling mm -hmm. choice, uh, is proportional to the distance. So that hiring someone from Papua New Guinea is more expensive to a Portuguese investor than hiring someone from Spain, okay? Mm, um, that, that's what we would need to get the same thing. I think it's reasonable to assume that intermediation costs are higher when, you, um, uh, uh, when, when you're more distant, but then you would, you would get, you'd get exactly the same outcome. I mean, you wouldn't need all that rational inattention thing and all of that, which I actually, you know, <laughs> Personally, I, I prefer simpler models. So yes. I was on the side of having that in the end. You know, we, when you have three co-authors, you can get a majority against you. And, uh, and that ended up in the appendix. But I, I think that's a fine modeling choice also. And uh, you just have to buy that the uh, intermediation cost depends on distance. I see, I see, thank you. Uh, very interesting. And my second question is more technical. So in international trade, in, in, in goods, um, we try to take into account intranational uh, trade flows to correctly identify trade costs because normally they're identified only in relative terms. Uh, 
yeah. and to avoid distance puzzle, right? So my question is, would it be important here? Would it be possible to include it here or there is no data, for example, on international capital flows? Okay. Um, so this is the same question, which was essentially asked during the talk. What do you do if you include uh, trade flows, II, yeah, uh, investment flows, II? So in the model, you invest in your own country. Uh, so if you if you look at the total savings, you know it gets divided into the part that mm -hmm. goes abroad and the part that stays at home. So in the model, you have II investment, um, and mm -hmm. uh, once you calibrate, you know sigma to one half, you add the betas. You measure Y and K using the world, uh, you know, using the pen world tables, and you do all the uh, basically the, the quantification of the model that I showed. Uh, mm -hmm. You generate II investment from that. Okay. And then you can, mm -hmm. I actually didn't show the matrix, but it's in the paper. Uh, what you can do is you can compare the model implied II investment to the actually observed II investment. These are not intra-country flows between regions because we don't have that dimension. This is aggregate investment of the country in itself. Uh, and they line up very okay. well. Yeah, they line up very mm -hmm. well. So, you know, and that's the flip side of home bias. If I show you that home bias lines up very well, then by definition, the residual of that is, you know, the residual from that is what each country invests in their own country. That's gonna line up very well too. So mm -hmm. it lines up very well, yeah. Great, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. We, we have it in the model. We don't use II investment data to generate anything that I showed you, except to confirm that you know the model implied II investment matches the distribution of actual II investment. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent, thanks. Uh, we run out of questions, but we also run out of time. And uh, uh, we will close in a second. I just want to thank Roman again, and I see people applaud uh, on Zoom. And uh, I would also mention that the next seminar will be May 4th with Claudio Ferraz speaking, and the one after will be June 1st by Liat Yariv. Uh, and so, uh, as usual, it's 3 p.m. London time, 4 p.m. Central European time. So thank you very much, uh, Roman, for this excellent Thank you, Sergei, for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you.